So thank you, everybody, for coming and for really much uh, lectures. Uh, today, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Dr. Eric Thompson, a Senior Policy Fellow in Ethics of Modeling and Simulations at the LSE Data Sciences. Gained her PhD in Physics from Imperial College, uh, research about the use of modeling to inform real-world decision-making, what model outputs really mean, and how we use models together with expert judgment who's working with NGOs, insurance companies, uh, UK government, other partners. And I found a quote from one of your uh, papers that I like, uh, because it got me really curious about what you say. Basic uncertainty. Successful, uh, successful anticipatory thinking is not about making good predictions. It is about agility when judging what information to gather, to grasp an unfolding landscape, and constant curiosity about what might be left out. Um, I thought that's very interesting. And I'm really looking forward to hear about becoming a good All right. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm really pleased to to talk to you all about. Um, I, I thought, you know, given that it's International Women's Day and we're talking about women in mathematics, that, you know, it might be helpful for the more junior colleagues if I talk a bit about my career and how I found things. Um, and maybe that's that I can also then kind of branch off from each of those observations into some, um, you know, uh, remarks about the work that I've done and what I'm doing now and how I've got to that point and uh, as I say about about ethics, about the ethics of mathematics because I think it's easy to say, to sort of assume that, that you know, maybe science has ethics but mathematics is beyond all of that, it's objective, it's neutral and we don't have to think about these questions of ethics but uh, as I hope I'll show you in 40 minutes time, um, I think that the ethics of mathematics and the ethics of being a mathematician and thinking about how we do maths uh, is fundamental and is really important and it's part of being a good citizen in our society. Um, so I shall start at the beginning, uh, that's me, about uh, 30 years ago, um, and that's my mother. Now. It is absolutely not a coincidence that she has a PhD in mathematics uh, and that I'm now standing in front of you today as a woman in mathematics. Um, you know, I show you this because she is the reason I'm here in that sense, because she brought me up not to be scared of maths, to love maths, to enjoy playing with maths, playing with patterns, playing with numbers, thinking about things in depth, um, and, you know, and, and showed by her life and her career, that that is that it's possible to be a woman in maths, um, and at a time when that was much more difficult than it is today. Uh, but also because this is important from the wider perspective of equity and equality of opportunity, right? It's uh, I am incredibly fortunate and incredibly privileged to have a mother who did a PhD in the 1970s on quantum stochastic processes, and that's partly why I'm here. Other people don't have that opportunity. They don't have that kind of background, and it is not a coincidence. It is not a coincidence that the majority of people, uh, you know, becoming professors of mathematics have got uh, parents or family in some way involved in in these kind of things. So, I just kind of put that up there to begin with, and I will circle back to it later. And when I think again about um, diversity and representation in the mathematical sciences, but uh, you know, just to say that that is, I think, important. So, um, moving sort of onward, uh, I, when I was little, as I say, my mum was very, always very encouraging about maths, but the maths that we were given at school was extremely boring, it was this sort of thing, you know, going through, writing out the same sorts of things many, many times, and, you know, you can imagine that when somebody sees that as their main introduction to mathematics, they don't think it's particularly interesting. They don't think it's particularly relevant to real life, and so they don't carry on and do it. They're not excited by it, because it's fundamentally not very exciting. Um, and so, you know, my, the way that my mother sort of got around that was by um, having books available, like Martin Gardner's Books of Puzzles, which maybe 
familiar to those of, of my sort of generation and older. Um, she was always very fond of mathematical origami. We would do, you know, making stellated dodecahedra out of paper, that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, as I got older, just having, having books around that were a, an introduction to other concepts in mathematics. So maybe in passing, I could say something about the recent proposals for Maths 218, which sound like a fantastic idea. And of course, it would be wonderful if our society in general was more numerate and more confident with, uh, with mathematics, with patterns, with logical thinking, you know, and with the basic functional skills of mathematics in everyday life. But that uh, the kind of mathematics that is often taught in schools doesn't remotely support that, and if you haven't enthused somebody about it by the time they're 16, you're not going to get very far by uh, forcing them to study it for another two years. Seems doomed to fail, but, um, but perhaps there are opportunities to change the way we think about teaching mathematics in order to make it feel more relevant, um, because obviously it is relevant, and you're here because you know how relevant mathematics is to our modern world and to decision making and public policy and uh, you know the, the foundation of everyday life, um, technology, uh, if almost everything that we do has a, a mathematical component. And so you know we, we can uh, we can support perhaps Rishi's um, aims, if not the if if, uh, if having some criticisms of the way that one might go about doing it. Okay, so uh, I did, you know, I, I did maths at school. I um, didn't particularly enjoy maths at school, but I enjoyed maths outside of school and doing sort of playing with mathematics, mathematical games. Um, and so then I did actually natural sciences at university, uh, where I specialised in physics, experimental and theoretical physics. And I got to the end of that um, first degree, thinking. Actually, you know, I'd like to continue to study, but I don't want to do quantum mechanics of incredibly small stuff, and I don't want to do cosmology on the sort of astronomical scales. I, what I'm really interested in is the human scale, the stuff in between, the uh, sort of fluid dynamics, statistical physics, those, you know, things, things that you can look at and understand, and things that you can prod and experiment on, perhaps. Um, now, weirdly enough, um, this was at Cambridge and the department, uh, basically you couldn't do that in the physics department, that was all counted as being in maths, so I had to switch to maths. So I did a fourth year of maths, um, where I took mainly fluid dynamics options, um, and then I did a, uh, I wrote an essay as part of that uh, fourth year of maths, um, looking at carbon sequestration in underground reservoirs, so that's what I put up here. Um, and the maybe just to explain a bit here, the, the idea is that you have uh, carbon dioxide and we don't want it to be in the atmosphere, we want to put it somewhere else. Um, so the, in principle, one can uh, inject it into the ground um, and you inject it into an, some geological formation underground that is suitable in some way um, to store it in the same way that oil is stored in underground reservoirs. So we have, uh, this is a picture of the um, the Sleipner field, which is in the North Sea, it's owned by Norway, um, and there are there are sort of two formations. They, there's one where the oil is, and they suck the oil out, and that goes off to be to be used and burnt. Um, and then in another sort of sandstone formation, they uh, compress and then inject the carbon dioxide. So uh, there are various sort of technicalities that I'm going to leave completely out, but um, what you can do is you, you inject your supercritical CO2, which is a fluid, and then it moves within that formation, so it is in a, a porous medium, um, and you say, well, you know, what are our questions? Our questions are, is it going to, you know, can we inject it? Is it going to, is it going to move through this formation in a way that will sort of let us actually store it there rather than just getting backed up or blocked somehow. Um, is it going to escape and get back to the atmosphere? And that would you know, defeat the whole point of doing it. Um, and is there any way to make it more permanent? Like might it migrate along on a very long time scale, migrate along this formation and then find some way to get to the surface and come out again? In which case we have a problem on a different time scale. Um, 
And so I, I spent a you know, relatively short amount of time, essentially a literature review and a little bit of investigation um, about that uh, during my uh, part three. And then I was looking for a PhD and I found a PhD topic on the same subject uh, at Imperial College sponsored by the new Grantham Institute at Imperial, which had just been set up. Um, and so I applied for that PhD and I started there. Um, and, you know, okay, I had a lot of other changes going on in my life at the same time and it was a bit sort of up and down, but effectively I struggled with that for various reasons and decided to take an interruption of studies. So I. Um, I then spent a few months working on a report about global oil depletion for the UK Energy Research Centre, which is also based uh, at Imperial. Um, and at that point, I kind of realised that there were huge, huge questions around all of this. You know, that there were there was the oil and CO2 question and the kind of carbon emissions and climate change and oh dear, you know, massive problem there. Um, and then also that actually, obviously, we know that oil is so important to everyday modern life, you know, produce all of these things from oil and from the energy generated by burning oil. Um, and that, so the, the report that I worked on was about oil depletion. So it was saying how much oil is there actually left on the planet and if we, how will we get it out and is it economic to get it out and, and how long would it last at current rates of consumption and what would we do next. Um, so that was uh, super interesting. The, the laws of fluid flow uh, in the porous medium obviously are the same for the oil and for the carbon dioxide and so having that kind of expertise one could then decide to go and work for an oil company um, helping them to get more oil out of the ground or you could go and work for um, a, well it would still be an oil company. Uh, working out how to sequester the carbon dioxide um, in these in these sandstone formations um, and how you can get it to to stick. Um, so you have a, I suppose, an ethical sort of question in terms of career. You know, you have you have some skills and interests, and you're able to apply those in many different ways. And this is perhaps a particularly um, particularly direct. Uh, an obvious situation where there's a, a choice of what to do. Um, but I sort of decided, sort of having done that, that I wanted to work more directly on the climate change problem. It felt to me that the, the difficulties around uh, carbon sequestration were not primarily technical, um, that actually this basically, it basically does work. You can inject the CO2 into these formations and you can do it in a clever way such that it will be stable. You know, you can see we're drawing a plume there, it, it rises, and in principle it's unstable. In principle it, it would come out, it would find a way out somehow. Um, but you can, uh, you can find ways to trap it, either, either trap it kind of as bubbles in a sponge, disconnected bubbles in a sponge, in which case it no longer migrates, um, or on the longer term it will uh, sort of carbonate into, into rock and then it will be permanent. Um, but it felt like there were much, much bigger questions around that that were not, uh, not technical at all. You know, they're political questions and they're social questions and they're economic questions because if we want to sequester the amount of CO2 uh, in these formations that would have a, a, you know, any sort of useful impact on carbon emissions, then it's essentially got to be at the same scale as the oil industry. And if it's got to be at the same scale as the oil industry, it's got to be attracting kind of the same orders of magnitude of money as the oil industry. Uh, and clearly it is not, there, there is no profit to be made by putting your CO2 down into some formation and unless there is government policy that says we are going to pay you to do that. Uh, so, so then you have the political questions about who's going to do it, who's going to fund it, how it is going to happen, why do we want it to happen, and what mechanisms do we use to make sure that it happens and to ensure that it has long-term effects rather than just being a system that can be gamed somehow. Um, anyway, so this all felt a bit terrifying. But, uh, 
then I then uh, during that interruption of studies, um, well, I mean, actually slightly after, because I'd started a new PhD at the Grantham Institute on, um, on North Atlantic storms. So I, I started this PhD uh, on carbon sequestration. After a, less than a year, I decided that for a number of reasons it wasn't for me. Um, and they were kind enough to say, OK, would you like a different PhD? Well, it's very generous of them, I think, uh, actually, to to take a risk on essentially a very flaky student. Um, but they said yes, and so I started another uh, PhD on um, North Atlantic storms um, and thinking about what would happen to those in a changing climate. And that was a case studentship with the Met Office. So it was partly funded by the Met Office and I had a Met Office supervisor. And this was in um, 2009. And around then, obviously, there was a peak of interest in climate change in 2007, 8, 9. Uh, and um, there was the, the infamous uh, conference in Copenhagen in 2009, the sort of last chance to save the planet when all the world leaders jetted in and uh, failed to save the planet. Um, and I went along to that because part of the Met Office uh, collaboration, they said, oh, you know, do you have any PhD students who would like to come along and help to man our stall? So I thought, yes, actually, I'd love to go. It'd be really interesting. Happy to sit on a stall, you know, and give out some Met Office leaflets, and I'd be really interested to see what happens. Um, and so I went, and they said, uh, "We'll pay for your plane ticket." And I said, "Hang on, isn't this a climate change conference? I'm not going on the plane. Uh, I'll go on the bus." So I got a bus with a with a protest group, actually, with Climate Camp, who'd organised these buses to go to Copenhagen. And so I went on that bus, and. Um, slept on the floor of a school into the north of Copenhagen and we sort of went in each day on public transport. Um, but I went in on the first day and I met up with the Met Office people there um, and there was, it was snowing, it was, you know, December in Denmark, it was cold, it was, uh, you know, pretty bleak generally and there was this absolutely enormous queue <laughs> stretching you know, probably a mile, probably longer than a mile, um, because they had their conference center, which held about 15,000 people, and somehow they'd registered about 45,000 people to go in, maybe on the expectation that most of them wouldn't turn up, but everybody turned up. So everybody was trying to get in. So I queued for about 10 hours outside in the cold on the first day, and then gave up, because that was clearly completely pointless. Um, and so I went along to the fringe events instead. So they, there's the, the main conference in the main conference centre, but then there was a whole load of fringe events organised by the people who'd gone there to protest, the sort of civil society and all that. Uh, and that was just super, super interesting, you know, and really, uh, you know, met loads of interesting people. And what was really striking was the contrast between the, the energy and the enthusiasm of those people outside the conference centre thinking about possible solutions and with, you know, imaginatively, and then this bunch of politicians inside the conference centre with their glossy stands and their leaflets and they've come in by plane and, uh, you know, and then, and last chance to save the planet and then they just completely fail, you know, and, and then, and then, well, that, what does that mean? Last chance to save the planet, oh, oops, sorry, we didn't do it. Um, so that was really kind of, a turning point for me personally, I guess, I realised that um, that relying on top-down action is, you know, yes, it's part of the, there, there will be no solution without top-down action, but the solution will not come only from top-down action. Um, and so, for example, since then, I haven't, I haven't been on a plane. Um, I think that that's, you know, that's something that I can easily choose to do personally to reduce my own carbon emissions dramatically from what they otherwise might be. So I accept talks to come and speak across the road and I don't accept talks to go and speak in the US because I don't want to, um, you know, I, 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 I mean, I don't have a, an absolute rule that I wouldn't if I, if I felt like it would be genuinely useful to do so, then I guess I would consider it. Um, but the longer I go without flying, the, the longer I have this nice sort of clean streak that I don't want to break. You know, I'm coming up to 15 years now, and uh, it would be a shame to go back to square one and have to say, oh no, 
one flight in 15 years. <laughs> um, but, you know, the point is that I'm still here and I'm still standing in front of you. And as a junior researcher, it felt like maybe that was career suicide and maybe I needed to go to these conferences and maybe, maybe I wouldn't be able to build a, a research profile. Maybe I wouldn't be able to collaborate with the best people. Maybe, you know, all the rest of it. Um, and actually what I found is that by imposing that constraint and, and just sort of deciding and saying I'm going to do that, so I've, I've had to find ways around it. I've had to... I, I, I've had to um, make sure that I develop networks locally in the UK uh, and you know Europe as well, but primarily in the UK, and focus on those and develop them and make sure that I don't lose them. Um, I've had to uh, give virtual talks, so I'm you know I was doing that pre-COVID, and suddenly we have a global pandemic and everybody's doing it, uh, which is great, and the. Um, it, this also has accessibility benefits, of course, that the kind of people who are able to just drop everything and go flying around the planet for a, for a, a five-day conference or a, even for just an hour's seminar, um, those are the people who haven't got uh, caring responsibilities. I have two small children. I don't particularly want to fly around the world, even if I decided that it would be reasonable to do so. Um, I don't want to be away from them for weeks on end. Uh, other people have other responsibilities that make it difficult, or um, you know, or other other reasons for which that is inaccessible. You know, maybe you don't have a budget for travel. Maybe you don't have um, maybe you don't have somebody who can take over your class. Maybe you are uh, from a from a uh, an area where it's hard to get a visa for that particular place. Um, there are so many reasons why virtual conferencing is incredibly helpful for accessibility to everybody. And so I really think one of my key messages is that we need to do more to make the most of the opportunity that we've had in the last uh, three years due to COVID um, to build on those gains and help to ensure that we have accessible science and accessible mathematics um, so that we have a wider diversity of people able to do maths. And I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna come back to why I think that's important mathematically as well as socially. Uh, okay, so that's my, so my PhD was about um, North Atlantic storms and I, uh, I mean, the first thing I did was a literature review and I looked at all of the different evidence um, that people had come up with in the past. Um, now, I think things have changed, I've moved on a bit in the 10 years since, but at the time there was basically no consensus. So you could find a model that said the North Atlantic storm tracks would move poleward or move equatorward or get stronger, get weaker, get more intense, get less intense, and um, they didn't even agree within their own error bonds. And so I thought, well, this doesn't tell me very much about North Atlantic storms or climate change, but it tells me a very great amount about the way that we make models and the way that we interpret models and our attitudes towards uncertainty ranges. Um, clearly, the uncertainty is being underestimated here. We, are, we have higher confidence than we ought to in the outputs of these models. Um, and so I had a couple of chapters on statistical and dynamical models of storm tracks and looked at how well those agreed with observation. Um, but I also spent quite a lot of time thinking about all these kind of you know, semi-philosophical questions about inference from models and how do, we, how do we know that the model knows what it's talking about? What evidence do we need to have from a model to be able to trust it? when we're using it to make decisions or to inform decisions. Um, so I thought, so this is kind of the math section of the talk. I'll, I'll say a bit about models um, and how we make them, how we use them and how we make inferences from them. So let's think about calibrating a model. <coughs> let's say you have uh, any, you know, anything, you have model input and model output and your model is what uh, you know, connects the two. Um, and, but your model is not perfect, so when you take observations, you find that the model and the observations don't perfectly line up, and in principle, you would like to use that to improve the model, and so you will um, you tweak the model in order to be able to reduce the, the lack of fit between model and observations. Uh, to do that, you need to define a loss function. So what is an appropriate loss function to use? So you might think of a, a sort of root mean square error or a standard linear regression. Um, 
what I want to say here is that the appropriate boss function may vary depending on who you are. So let's take an example. Uh, let's say the model output is air temperature in Brighton. That's the target that you're trying to predict. Um, well, what's the loss function? Okay, so suppose you're an ice cream seller and you have got an ice cream van that you take out and you're trying to sell ice cream to people. Well, you probably don't care very much about the difference or, or the accuracy even really at the low temperatures because that's the middle of winter and you're not going to be taking your ice cream van out anyway because it's packed away. Um, you probably care a lot more about the top end and you're interested in the difference between 22 degrees and 26 degrees. That might make quite a big difference to your ice cream sales. So you're interested in a loss function which looks at the top end of this, um, of this domain and uh, which will prioritise and give better scores to models which are better calibrated at, at, in that part of the domain. If you're a civil engineer and you have a project in Brighton and you are laying concrete foundations for a new building, uh, then you might be interested in whether or not it's going to be below freezing because below freezing your concrete won't cure correctly and it will crumble and you'll have to lay it again. Um, so that would be extremely costly. So maybe then you don't care at all about the high end and the difference between 22 degrees and 26 degrees you don't really care about the low end because if there's any risk of it being minus 10 you're not going to go out there anyway um, but you're really interested in the middle and the sort of the borderline between um, zero degrees or you know less than zero degrees or more than zero degrees and 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 the accuracy you know, if it says two degrees there's probably still a chance it's going to be below zero but if it says 10 degrees hopefully you're in the clear um, so your loss function may be very uh, you know, very, very constrained. And then similarly, maybe you're Public Health England and you're interested in hospital admissions, um, then on the average day, the weather makes probably not, not, not much difference at all, but on an extreme day, when it's extremely hot or extremely cold, then you'll be see, see people being admitted to hospital with, uh, with heat stress, or if it's very cold, perhaps they've slipped on ice. So then there are likely to be um, correlations at the extremes and probably you don't care very much in the middle and so your loss function will be different so the point is that when you are calibrating a model your choice is not value neutral loss functions are utility functions and as a utility function they imply value judgments about the relative importance of different outcomes so yes you could make an argument that um, you know, the, 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 the sort of least information strategy is to weight all of these equally, maybe. I mean, a root mean square error probably doesn't really weight these equally because it pushes things towards the ends, doesn't it? Um, but you're implying a value judgment. So the question is, who is using this and what are they getting out of it? And this, I think this is a, this is a wider question um, that applies, for example, to uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning models, which use some of them have a very well-defined objective function, some of them it's sort of hidden in the mechanics of exactly what's going on, but uh, understanding what it is that is being optimised I think is really important. Uh, okay, so evaluating models. Um, a slightly different point is that the, the choice of evaluation tool that you might make depends on how you think about model error, and this depends on you know, perhaps your mathematical training, to some extent your personality, the sort of the way, just the way that you think and conceptualise the idea of there being a model which is not perfect and a real world which you're trying to model and the difference between them. So if you're a statistician, then you probably say, okay, I've got this super complicated thing which is reality and I've got probably quite a complicated thing which is my model and when I subtract them, I'll get something which is hopefully randomly distributed because I, I've sort of, by definition, I've modelled everything that I understand and the stuff that's left must be more or less random, so I'm going to call it, you know, some kind of random distribution uh, with whatever parameters that random distribution has. Okay, fine, I mean that's a, that's a defensible point. Um, if you're a dynamical systems person rather than a rather than a statistician, then you'll say, I've got a complex dynamical system and I'm subtracting another complex dynamical system. And that gives me 
a third complex dynamical system that is even less accessible and more difficult to understand, and it's going to look really weird. You know, if I, if I sort of subtract these weird spikes from those weird spikes, I get some other weird spikes. Um, so I'm going to have a, a very structured uh, model error term that I will have to think of as a dynamical system, and I will have to think about the structure of that error. Um, or if you're not a mathematician at all, supposing you're an anthropologist and you come to this and you say, well, you know, there's reality out there, which is the same reality that we all have access to, um, but your model is going to depend on your point of view. It's going to depend on what you think is important. It's going to depend on, um, you know, how, how you've chosen to model it, what kinds of mathematics you're drawing on, and, you know, the tractability of things that can be implemented, say, on a computer. Um, in which case, your model error is, is sort of not really statistical and it's not really dynamical, actually it's social and political. And it's something which reflects the, um, the blind spots and the biases that you as a modeler might have. Um, and it's something that, you know, maybe you're trying to evaluate uh, some kind of decision relevant question you as a person will have a different experience and different ideas about what's important than somebody else might do. And so your model has errors which encapsulate your social and political perspective and somebody else's model will have errors which encapsulate their social and political perspective. Um, now I don't, see any, I don't say that any of these three is, is correct or is better than the others. I think we have to understand that there's a, a bit of everything going on. It's, it's all of the above. Um, but if you start to if you start to say there is only one appropriate evaluation tool, or there is only one appropriate objective function, or there is only, or even worse, that your model is correct or has been validated, um, then uh, then you start to introduce and, and and hide these blind spots and biases, and we have to really think about that. Uh, okay, so so I so then I, after my PhD I came to LSE. I was at the Centre for the Analysis of Time Series, which was part of the Statistics Department um, for about nine years, and then that that closed down, and I moved to the LSE Data Science Institute just over the road. Um, and during my ten years at LSE, I've been looking at. Uh, different examples. So I've been on short-term contracts for most of that time. It's been extended by maybe a year here, or six months there, or eight months there. And it's been on you know, more uh, different um, funding and projects than I care to count. Uh, but it's been super exciting, and it's been really rooted in real-world examples and collaborations with people who are making decisions, whether that's insurance companies, um, the Department for Energy and Climate Change, as was, uh, other consortia of academics um, looking at climate impacts um, and then this particular example is a NERC funded project um, for, about humanitarian decision making in advance of, of crises. So the idea here is this is, um, this is Madagascar and the forecasts are available for um, several days in advance potentially. I mean this is a particularly good one. This is the recent Cyclone Freddy um, that hit Madagascar and then Mozambique. Um, but the idea is that if you have got warning and you've got several days, each of the different colours is one day here, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days warning there, which is, uh, that's not representative at all. That's one of the, one of the best ones. Normally, normally you get much more of a spaghetti in the spaghetti plot and actually, you don't have much confidence, you don't know quite where it's going, and it may wiggle around a bit. Um, but in a situation like this, you know, in principle, you've got loads of warning, and you could get out there, and you could start boarding up houses, uh, you could evacuate people, you can do something with the sea defences, perhaps, depending where you are. Um, you can think about pre-positioning aid supplies that you'll be able to get to people quickly, because we know what are the sorts of things that happen when a, a, a hurricane, a cyclone, hits a, a country like Madagascar. We know what the kinds of hazards are and we can take action to mitigate those. Um, so I was working with the START Network, which is a consortium of humanitarian agencies, and I, I began by uh, some, with some, some work on heat wave in Pakistan, and again, with the same aim, saying, 
what information is in the forecast, how far in advance could we reasonably take action, uh, and what would we be able to, you know, what kind of actions could we take that will that will mitigate the impact on vulnerable communities. Um, and then, so I did that. That was one NERC funded project, which was you know, only a, a year or two, I guess. And then another one, which was also NERC funded, um, which was a bit a bit bigger and a bit longer. Um, and that one we extended to look at Cyclone as well. Um, but this has been really interesting because it really uh, sort of emphasizes to me, I think, the, the difference between the, the sort of ideal world maybe our ideal model of the way that science interacts with, uh, with decision making and the sort of, you go away and you make your model or you come up with your advice and then you, you throw it over the fence to the decision maker and it's their job to implement it. And I think what we've done, hopefully done well during this collaboration is, is make it much more of a two way process that there'll be discussion about what their red lines are and what the ability is of the science to support the decisions that they want to make and then you've got you're sort of going both ways you're thinking about tailoring the science to the decision and also what's been quite exciting is tailoring the decision to the science so for example on the basis of our work they, they've been trialing a, a much quicker um, funding release um, in, in advance of cyclones because typically you don't get eight days notice maybe you get three days notice but if it takes you if it takes you 48 hours for your committee and your selection panel to actually uh, decide to release the funding and then it takes you, a, you know, more time to decide on the projects and actually get the funding to where it's meant to be and then to actually do the actions, then you've missed your window of opportunity. You have to do things quicker. Uh, so that's been a super exciting thing that I've, that I've really enjoyed. It's been really, you know, satisfying to be involved with that and to help um, to make better decisions and hopefully to help improve the outcomes for people and communities on the ground in these kind of places. Okay, so then now we're getting more towards present day now. So in, um, in 2019, uh, I was at a meeting um, with the London Mathematical Laboratory, which is a group, um, it's an independent research organisation based in West London. and. Uh, and they, they were sort of saying, well, what are you going to do next with all of this? It sounds really exciting. And I said, well, I think I'd like to write a book. Um, and they said, oh, yeah. Uh, how, about, how about we fund you to write that book? So, I mean, this has been incredible because, as I said, I've got two small children. My evenings and weekends are pretty non-negotiable. I don't work at the evenings and weekends. And if I was full-time in an academic position, there's just no way I would have written this book. It wouldn't have happened. Um, but LML uh, very kindly said that they would basically sponsor me, pay for my time for two days a week, um, so that I'd be able to write this book, uh, which I did. And I've got, I've got a couple of copies if anybody wants one. Um, I should have got them out so I can hold it up. But uh, it's, so it took me, well, I, mean, I guess two years to write the book. Uh, mid-pandemic, <laughs> which was an interesting experience. I don't recommend writing a book. It's, uh, it's, it was very painful, um, but it got done. Uh, and it absolutely wouldn't have happened without LML, so I'm incredibly grateful to them for that and for that opportunity. Um, and so the book is about all of these kinds of questions about how we deal with the fact that models are not reality, the map is not the territory. That's obviously not a new observation, but the question is, what can we do about it? What are the potential pitfalls that we're going to fall into? And what is it that we can do to improve our use of models and to improve our mathematical and statistical inference based on the models that we happen to have? Uh, so I'll just say a bit about what sorts of questions I'm interested in there. Um, so this model is probably one that you're all familiar with from a couple of years ago. So in uh, the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, this model was, uh, was essentially the main driver of the decision making in the UK in advance of lockdowns. This is the Imperial College model. Um, and so it looks at uh, you know, what the different policy options are, what would be the number of hospital beds occupied, uh, is, this, is this remotely supportable? I mean, obviously these modelled peaks are totally catastrophic for the NHS and so the, uh, the, the idea about flattening the curve came from 
very simple models like this one, um, saying what can, what can we do to reduce that peak pressure, uh, either to spread it out, I mean ideally to stop it, but of course until the vaccines were inside there was no possibility of stopping it, and until, and you know, now that we have vaccines there's still no possibility of stopping it apparently. Um, but the point is that this, this is the kind of thing where you are <coughs> right at the science policy interface. You know, the, the, uh, the model is the science policy interface, and the modeler, the person who's talking about it and explaining it. Um, so I'm interested in questions like uh, how does, you know, who, who decides what are the kind of interventions that one can put in these models? How, how political is that, or how scientific is that, and how does the how does that sort of circular relationship? The policymaker says we'd like to be able to model this, and the modeler says it's tractable to model this, but it's not tractable to model that. Sorry, guys, we just can't put that in. Um, and then how that then feeds back into into the question of what actually happens, and obviously influences millions of people. Um, and then the same question again arises for, for example, integrated assessment models. So you don't need to look at the, the details here, but these colourful bars on the left-hand side are the energy mix between fossil fuels and renewables in, uh, in a baseline scenario where there's no climate policy um, versus the energy mix on the right-hand side, these six models for two degree scenarios where we meet those Paris targets. Um, and you can see, obviously, in order to meet the Paris targets, you need more renewables and biomass and less of the fossil fuels. That makes sense. Um, but they don't all agree. You know, they are, they're quite different. They look different. They have different reliance on, for example, nuclear. You can see some of them, some of them are very gung-ho on nuclear and some of them face it out almost completely. Uh, it depends. So that depends on the assumptions that are going into this model. Um, it depends on what you think is uh, technically feasible in terms of, say, the scale-up of solar power, which has consistently been underestimated. Uh, it depends on what you think is politically feasible around nuclear or um, scaling up biomass. Um, and so the, uh, you also have questions about whether you introduce other things. Do you include behaviour change in your model? or not, because if you put in behaviour change at an effective cost of $2 per tonne of carbon avoided, it would be extremely attractive and it would be the main thing that we do here. If you put it in at a cost of $2,000 per tonne, then it's not going to happen at all and you rely on other technologies. And if you're somewhere in between, then you're somewhere in between. And the same goes for all of these. If you put nuclear in with its full decommissioning costs, then it probably looks economically completely unviable. If you just say the, the sort of levelised cost of electricity from nuclear is whatever uh, you know the generating cost, the operational cost, then it looks pretty low. Uh, so you have a you have a decision, you have a value judgment to make. You how, how you do that, and somebody's done that for each of these models. They've had to make a value judgment and explicitly stick it into the model, and then it it implies what kind of solution you get. Uh, I won't say too much about that now. If if you have got a set of six models, how should you put them together? Um, you can, you could just average them. You could do model selection. Uh, you could say one of these agrees better than the others uh, over our historical period, and therefore we expect it to agree better in the future. You could do that. Um, there are a whole load of reasons why I think that's not very supportable when we're talking about these forward-looking, essentially extrapolatory models where we have either social, underlying social um, elements of the decision, social and political elements to the decision making, uh, which make it unpredictable in that sense. Um, and also we have uh, the underlying conditions might be changing, so for example climate change, uh, or we just don't really know what's, you know, what the environment will be like. Um, we can't treat these as six independent throws at a dartboard. So we can't use standard statistical methods to treat these as if they were samples from an underlying distribution which will tell us something about the truth. So what do we need to do? Uh, it, I, th I think how I would like to reframe it is to say that instead of knowing that all models show X, we need to convince ourselves that no plausible model could show not X. Now, if we reframe in that way, it's obvious that the word plausible is doing all of the work in that sentence. How do we define what is a plausible model? Well, 
in order to do that, uh, obviously there's going to be a degree of talking and thinking, and I, you may have a different idea about what is plausible than I do. So how do we how do we extend those bounds as far as we can? We're going to have this, the classic bias variance trade off. How do we extend those bounds as far as we can without you know being so open minded that your brain falls out and 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 taking models that are not remotely plausible? Where do we draw the boundary? Um, well, I think what we need to do is to improve the diversity of models, we need to see greater diversity of modelers, the people that are doing the modeling. So this is where I'm circling back to my original point. Um, that what we need, I think, in, in maths and in science is to have a wider variety of people from different social backgrounds doing this modeling in such a way that they can incorporate their different perspectives, they, they have different ideas about what is important about a situation and what is not important, and then hopefully we will be able to explore model space, and model space of course is infinite dimensional, but we'll be able to explore more of it and get a better handle on our uncertainty ranges. Um, so in, in that sense, I think that promoting mathematical diversity is incredibly important. Now there's all the usual axes of sort of age, gender, racial background, etc. And you know, I think those are important, but perhaps I think they're less important than um, social background, life experience, and political leanings, which is a difficult one. You know, you, you may say actually we want to have political consensus, but the reality is that there isn't a political consensus. Um, there is strong polarization, and the only way to make a model which will be credible and acceptable to a wide range of people is to say actually we need to incorporate people with different political perspectives into the modeling process as well. And yes, that could be painful, but uh, I think it needs to happen. Um, so just to end on a positive note then, the, when we're making mathematical models, they are not just there to represent or predict the world, they're there to change the world. You know, you are making, you're making models ultimately because you want to be able to have information on which you can act in the world to make it better than it would have been otherwise. That's the whole point of being there and doing that. Um, so how do, we, how do we sort of scrutinize those ethical and social judgments that become embedded in models and how, how can we develop them in the future to, uh, to use models and statistical methods that can help us to make more positive, inclusive and value-centered decisions? There are my two takeaways. Social diversity is mathematically important. Mathematical diversity is socially important. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I think I'll share as a, as a kind of caring emergency as well, so I'll, I'll take off. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Very impressive and interesting questions. <laughs> um, so you, when you were talking about the model, um, you were talking about error, you were talking about the difference between the model output and the, uh, the actual output. Yep. You said there were three categories. Um, do you mind uh, talking a little bit more about the, that, the the structured uh, difference, I, I think called the dynamical yeah, system. Yeah, so we, yeah. Okay. Perhaps um, with an example, because I'm, I'm having a hard time. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you've got a set of um, PDEs or something, and you, you, write, you write your set of differential equations, I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of the climate system or, or the weather, um, you have reality, which is out there in the real world, and you have your model, which is in your computer, um, and your model is a complex dynamical system, well, what you see when you subtract model from reality is that there is extremely structured error. There's, like, there's a cold blob in the North Atlantic, uh, there are things that are represented really well, and there are things that are represented less well. If you, if you, ask, a, um, if you ask a climate scientist what is it that we need to do better with models, they wouldn't say at all that the error is random. They'd say we need to do better on cloud parameterizations because there are strong relationships between uh, the, the kind of 
what the cloud parameterizations look like and large scale measures like the climate sensitivity. Um, and so in principle, you would say, ah, well, that's great. You know, if, if there's structure in the error, that gives us something to go back and, and, and tweak the parameters of the model until we lose that structure. We want, you know, we want randomly distributed residuals. Um, but you can't do that because the, the constraints that are uh, imposed on the model by needing to fulfill the, the, the laws of physics, conservation of mass and, and everything else, actually are also incredibly strong. And they, they end up imposing a great deal of structure, which means that you, you can't just tweak a couple of knobs to make that error look random. Right. It will always have structure. You know, it, it will always be sort of spiky and interesting and, and express some dynamical uh, some underlying dynamics of what it is that you've got wrong or that you're misrepresenting about the system. But the statistician would say, just keep going until you get the randomly distributed residuals. And the physicist says, no, that's just not physically possible. Does that make sense? That yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it clarifies it uh, a bit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I had more of a general question. So basically, as you explained, uh, the pathway to research can be long and challenging in terms of like, it's sometimes difficult to tell in advance what exactly you want to do. And I was just wondering, like, overall, like, do you have any just like general advice on uh, how to like continue f finding one's way towards like? Mm, that's a difficult question. Um, yeah, I don't know. So I've never had a career plan, mm -hmm. or you know, we're supposed to have career development reviews and sit down with somebody and say. Uh, Know, what, do, what are you hoping to do in the next five years? And I've never had any good answer to those kind of questions. Um, I mean, very trite advice would be do what you find interesting and exciting. Uh, but everybody says that. Um, what I found worked well for me was to set boundaries and then not compromise on them. Um, like, and may, you know, that's also a reflection of being in a privileged position as well on various dimensions. Um, you know, I feel pretty confident that if academia doesn't want me, I can go away and get a job somewhere else. And and you guys here should feel really confident about that as well. Um, I think, you know, when I was maybe coming up through the system, I felt that academia was the only option and I didn't really understand what other career options were out there and open to me. And I think that has changed a bit. I think that universities are better at explaining to PhD students and postdocs and undergrads, I mean, what, what the other possibilities are and how they can contribute and that being a, an academic or being a professor isn't necessarily the best possible thing you could do with your life. Um, so, I, I mean, I, it's really difficult, I think, as a, as a young researcher these days. Life is hard and funding is difficult to find and contracts are short and awkward, um, so I, I sort of sympathise on that and I don't know I don't know what one can do with, about that other than join the union and uh, <laughs> pay for better working conditions. Right. <laughs> okay. yes, oh, I have a very, very general question. You mentioned you haven't been on a flight for 15 years, that's yep. really, really impressive. And I'm just uh, like, uh, wondering how can you achieve that, like, especially you have to children, like maybe for education purposes or something. Yeah, yeah um, well I don't, I mean I'm, I don't have any family overseas. If I did have family overseas I clearly would have made a different decision. Um, but apart from that, it's not difficult. I mean you just literally just don't buy the tickets and you don't go and you don't turn up at the airport. Yeah, maybe as it's an international student. I know, and of course <coughs> you have many other things that you need to balance in your life and so I don't at all say that I would expect other people to do the same as me. That you know, that happened to be something that I felt that I could do, and I feel it has worked well for me. I feel almost that it's been good for my academic career because it's you know it's a complete waste of time to go to a long distance just to give an hour's talk to a bunch of you know an audience who could have heard you speak online and probably aren't even that interested anyway. They're probably only there for free sandwiches. So <laughs> why? Uh, <laughs> So, you know, I've, I've only come across the road to give this talk, so if you're only here for the free sandwiches, that's absolutely fine. And do have the vegetarian ones. Um, but, 
I mean, no, joking aside, I think it, I think it has actually been good for my career. I think it made me sort of memorable and interesting. Uh, and the opportunities that I've turned down have definitely been balanced out by the opportunities that have arisen. And, and I think, you know, it's made me more mindful about developing connections and kind of making the most of what I do have as well. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, so, in, in uh, sort of response to that, I think one of the things is it can be very sort of discipline dependent. I mean, yeah. if you work in an area where you're actually very isolated in what you do, I mean, I, I'm yeah. a historian of maths, and actually, we're quite a rare breed in this, in this country. Um, but I mean, I completely, you know, take the point. But I do think that, you know, for me, one of the things that really Develop my career particularly as a woman and whatever has been the personal contacts that I've made the, the you know the people that I've met who are having met them then you, know, you continue with that and I think you know so I think that is something that one has to you know, take into account um, one of the things I wanted to kind of ask you a, a bit about but one of your slides you were talking about we need to have kind of diversity of, of different people and all that things when we're meeting and, and then you mentioned sort of different political leanings, however uncomfortable that might be. How do you go about <laughs> doing that? Um, I don't know. I mean, so how about taking uh, vaccine scepticism as a non-controversial example? Um, so, I mean, supposing you're a vaccine skeptic who's read various bits of misinformation in the media about how terrible they are. Um, what is it that will convince you to take a more science-based view? If I, if I uh, have got a fancy model and I'm a professor with the right letters after my name, is that going to convince you? If I then run that model again multiple times, is that going to convince you? If I shout louder and appeal to my expertise, is that going to convince you? No, I think the only way that, that those people are going to be convinced or at least to be drawn into a discussion about the relative merits of different policies. The only way to do that is to uh, demonstrate to them that their concerns are being taken seriously, that their perspective can be incorporated within the models and to come to some kind of co-production of a model that is in principle acceptable to both sides. And I think at that point you have something that you can start to talk about. And yes. It's difficult, so, maybe it's not possible. Yeah, but, so it's getting that, but like if getting, I said, getting them into yeah, that. But if I said I was a mind reader, you know, and that I could predict the card that you've got under your book, and that I'll predict it, you know, the nine of diamonds, and I get it right, and I get it right again, and I get it right again. As a good Bayesian, if I get it right 10 times in a row, you're gonna have to accept that I'm a mind reader, right? Yeah. <laughs> or no, because you have other options. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just showing you more evidence isn't going yeah, to no, convince sure, you. Sure. It's the same for the sort of vaccine skeptics and similar. You don't need you don't need more evidence of the same kind. You need to be able to control the uh, the conditions in which I'm making that prediction. You need to uh, you know put me in a different room and examine you know all the possible ways that I might have cheated. You have to be in the room. Yes, you've got to get them. I mean that's the difficult. You have to get them in the room. So that so yes, it's difficult. How do you actually do that in practice? I've got no idea. Um, but it's, I think it's the only way, you know, just, just predicting the card again and again is yeah. not going to, it will, it will, if anything, it will only make you more convinced that I'm cheating. And I think the same goes for the vaccine scepticism and maybe for climate scepticism and all of the other kind of anti-science and pseudoscience that we have out there that is a major, major problem. slightly self-indulgent talk, but I thought, uh, <laughs> since you invite me to give a women in maths yeah. talk, rather than a talk about my research, I'll, I'll talk about my research, but I'll also say... Honestly, this, this was the kind of talk that you would love to have. This is what you wanted. Okay, good. This is what you wanted. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. That I don't want. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.